this morning, uh, I have a quote, one to um, help me focus my thoughts, but also to give you a, a glimpse of where we're heading, uh, headed over these next uh, several Sundays during Lent. This quote's by Howard Macy. The spiritual life cannot be made suburban. It is always frontier. And we who live in it must accept and even rejoice that it remains untamed. Did you catch that? Did you hear it? I want to read it again so it just kind of resonate in your heart and in your mind. The spiritual life cannot be made suburban. It is always frontier. And we who live in it must accept and even rejoice that it remains untamed. Far too many of us who call ourselves Christian settle for a tamed suburban religion when a life in the wilderness following the spirit of the living God is being offered. Now this Advent season, this is the first Sunday of Advent and, and we are being offered an invitation from God to follow Jesus into the wild, into the wilderness. In the next 40 days and the next Sundays between now and Easter, we will be focused on one question. How do we follow Jesus into the wilderness? And what we're going to do over these next 40 days and these next Sundays during Lent is we're going to focus on one passage of scripture, one story, and we're going to look at it from several different angles. We're going to look at those days when Jesus, those 40 days when Jesus spent in the wilderness alone with God, those 40 days when he was tempted by Satan, and those 40 days before he moved out and began his public ministry. We'll look at that scripture and we're going to look at it from several different angles. But this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first two verses. And I want to reread those for us right now. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. The scripture says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil he ate nothing during these days and at the end of them he was hungry jesus was full of the spirit <laughs> the holy spirit and it says that the spirit led him into the wilderness this wilderness journey is not something that that just happened to jesus jesus intentionally chose to go into the wilderness this wilderness experience, this wilderness road was not Jesus being lost, but a place where the Spirit led him. It's not something that happened to him. It's something he initiated. Jesus went into the wilderness to spend solitude, time alone with God for 40 days. During that time, Jesus was seeking God's face. He was listening for God's voice. During those 40 days, the Lord was clarifying the call on Christ, was clarifying Jesus' identity as the son of the living God. Jesus was on a mission to understand his mission. He was in the wilderness seeking out his purpose. He fasted and he prayed and he was tempted and he came out of the wilderness filled with the power of God and with the clarity 
that he was to lead a community of faith into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is inviting you and me to follow him into that place, into the wild. So I'm, uh, I'm asking you this week, this morning, to consider the invitation. Consider going into the wild with Jesus. These next 40 days between now and, and Easter, would you do some of the things that Jesus did? Will you, we're going to learn some things of spiritual practice and spiritual discipline, things that we can do in the wilderness to, be, uh, to, to, to live into the spiritual life that we're invited into. First, would you spend some time in solitude with God? Do you think you could do that? Sometime over these next 40 days, could you spend some time alone with God? And it might mean you have to fast from something. <laughs> Maybe you need to fast from the TV a little bit each day. Maybe you need to decide to fast from your telephone or fast from Facebook. Maybe it, needs, it means you need to fast from eating chips on the couch and get up and go into your prayer closet and spend a little time alone with God. Can you do that some, make that part of your spiritual life, your experience, your day lived experience over these next 40 days, spending time alone with God? I'm going to tell you, I think most of us know that when we spend time alone with God, it can be a scary place. <laughs> It can cause a little fear and trembling. And some of us never do it. And we settle for a tame suburban religion rather than experience a wild and adventurous spiritual relationship with the living God. I've been wondering this week, what is it that scares us about this wilderness road? What is it that keeps us from going into the wild with Jesus? I, I came up with three things. One, when we're alone with God, the sunlight of God's spirit will shine on us. It will shine into our lives. And we become keenly aware of our character defects. It just happens when you are in the presence of God, you become aware of those places in your lives, those character defects. You find yourself doing a fearless and searching moral inventory, and you realize you're coming up short. When you're in God's presence, you also become aware that God's desire is to exercise the demons that are hidden in your past, the demons that you would rather keep hidden in the closets of your basement. When you go into the wilderness, the demons come out and they tempt you. And they tell you lies they've told you before, the lies you've tried to ignore, the lies you've believed and hold you in bondage. And you would rather pretend like they're not there. When we spend time alone with God, there's another thing that I think scares, scares us. We realize that God has given us the freedom freedom to choose a different way, to write a different life script. We are free in Christ when we meet God in the wilderness, when we spend time alone with God, we realize that we are free moral agents. We are free to make choices. And that freedom says we can, if we want, we can break 
codependent relationships with the lies that we've believed. We can break codependent relationships and patterns that are unhealthy for us. It means that this freedom that Jesus offers means that we can live into a different life, that we can really change. And change scares us. When we decide to change and leave behind old ways and old patterns and break ourselves from the old lies that we're so familiar with, it gets scary because we're living into the unknown. And as crazy as it sounds, many of us would rather choose the lies and the harmful patterns of our past because they're familiar rather than write a new story and live into the freedom of the spirit that Christ is offering us. Daniel Taylor says this, we are free to change the stories by which we live because we are genuine characters and not mere puppets. Many of us live like we're puppets, like the world is fixed, and like that forces beyond us control us. Forces from our past control us. He goes on and says, we can choose our defining stories. We can do so because we actively participate in the creation of our stories. We are co-authors as well as characters. Few things are as encouraging as, real, as the realization that things can be different and that we have a role in making them so. Let me reread that last line. Few things are as encouraging. And I would add the word scary. Few things are as scary as the realization that things can be different and that we have a role in making them so. In the Gospel of John, it says, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you are alone with God in the desert, you come face to face with the truth, and the truth will set you free. John says, if the Son sets you free, then you'll be free indeed. St. Paul says, the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Romans, Paul says, no longer are we slaves to sin. We are now slaves to righteousness. We're free to live under grace, free to change, free to live a new life, free to live different, and freedom, that kind of freedom can be scary. Here's another reason I think we avoid uh, the wilderness road and settle for a, a suburban religion. The one we follow, the one whose image we bear is wild and untamed. <laughs> what do you think about that? Our God is not a suburban God. <laughs> Our God is wild and adventurous passionate and zealous. The scripture says our God is a jealous God, an all-consuming fire. Our God burns away the chaff in our lives. It melts it away and turns us into pure gold. That's the kind of passion and power our God has. Our God rides on the thunderstorms, and Rich Mullen said he comes with thunder in his fist. 
Our God is the God whose palm scooped out the oceans and filled the oceans with things like killer whales and man-eating sharks. <laughs> Our God is powerful and wild and adventurous. God shakes the earth with earthquakes and volcanoes, and he fills the universe with stars and planets. Our God is not this tame, gentle shepherd that carries sheep in his arms. Our God is a shepherd who takes sticks and beats away the lions and the bears that threatens his children. Our God is a God of passion and power. And the one we follow into the wilderness, this Jesus is the one who walks on the water and his words speak and the storms in our lives go calm. Jesus is the one who speaks authority over sickness and disease. We see it over and over again in the gospel stories that Jesus heals the sick those who are blind, he gives them eyes to see. Those who are deaf, he heals their ears and they can hear. Those who can't speak, he touches their tongue and they speak words. They come to life. Jesus is the one who looks demons in the eyes and casts them out speaks authority over them. Jesus is the one who confronts the powers and principalities of the empires of this world, and he speaks words, prophetic words of truth and justice. Jesus is the one who looked death in the eye, was crucified, dead, and buried, and came back to life. Our God is courageous and wild and scary and free. Is that the kind of God you want to follow? <laughs> or would you prefer a suburban, tamed religion that's safe and predictable? You know, in that book, many of us have read or heard or watched the movie called The Chronicles of Narnia. The book by C.S. Lewis. If you haven't heard the story, it's about four children who go to a place called Narnia and they fight the, the, the white witch who has frozen the land of Narnia. It's always winter and never summer. And these children are summoned to this place by this king called Aslan. Aslan's a lion. And they're there to wage war against the white witch. And before they meet Aslan, they're having a little conversation with the beavers, Mr. and Miss Beaver. And, and they're telling the children about Aslan. And, and Lucy asks, is, is Aslan safe? And Miss Beaver says, safe? <laughs> Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Our God is not safe, but our God is good. Powerful, holy, free, and untamed. And this God is the one whose image you bear. You are created to be powerful, holy, free, and wild. The third thing about this wilderness road, while the spiritual, why the spiritual life and, and solitude with God might be scary, when we pay attention to our spiritual lives, we become aware that we live in what C.S. Lewis calls enemy-occupied territory. You know, we live in a war zone. That's the world we live in. 
there is a battle raging against the forces of good and the forces of evil. And as long as we settle for a suburban religion, we can live unaware of the battle. We can pretend that spiritual warfare doesn't exist. But as soon as we begin spending time in the wilderness and spend time alone with God and our hearts become in tune with the Spirit of God, this living God, and the ways of the kingdom of God, we become aware that there is an enemy to the kingdom. Second Corinthians 2, 11, Paul says, we are not aware of the Satan's schemes. First Peter 5, verse 8 says, be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And then Paul in Ephesians says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, folks, if you settle for a suburban religion, Satan will leave you alone. <laughs> you are no threat to his kingdom. But when you enter the wilderness and you begin seeking a relationship with the living God, I'm telling you, you're picking a fight with the devil. <laughs> you become aware that the kingdom of hell is waging a war against the kingdom of heaven. And you, as a child of the most high king, have a role to play in the war. You know, some people say that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. <laughs> some others, like Erwin McManus, will push back and say, living in the center of God's will is the most dangerous place to live your life. God's will is for the kingdom of love to overtake and to overcome the kingdom of darkness. And when you realize that you are a child of the Most High King, you begin to realize your role in this family of God is to wage war against those forces of evil and injustice and darkness in whatever forms they present themselves. You might remember, some of you might remember um, a, a few years back, probably more than I would like to imagine, there was a Bible study floating around by a guy named Henry Blackaby. It was called Experiencing God. And uh, he had this theory, this way to know God's will for your life. He, he said, simply look around and ask the question, where's God moving? And then join God in that movement, which is a nice way to think. But Erwin McManus flips it. And he said, if you want to know God's will for your life, <laughs> and if you want to experience God, look around and see where the devil's moving. Look around at where there's darkness and then follow Jesus into that place. Follow Jesus into that place and resist the devil. Follow Jesus into those places of darkness and bring light. Follow Jesus into those places where there's injustice and pain and suffering and bring hope and goodness and redemption. Bring the gospel, bring the good news to those places and you will experience God's power in the wild. Man. Yeah. Following Jesus into the wilderness is a scary place. It's wild because there is a spiritual war and you will find yourself in the middle of the struggle. And that's why Paul says, you know, you better suit up. Put on the armor of God. Stand firm and be strong. 
Well, here's the challenge or the invitation for you this morning. I believe it's a, I believe it's an invitation from God to the church of the promise. Do you want to settle for a suburban religion and play it safe? Or do you want to follow Jesus into the wild? Over the next 40 days, will you spend some solitude with God, some time alone with God? Would you be willing to just take a little time each day or or a big block of time during the week and be alone with God. and Let God um, shine his light into your soul and expose and exercise those demonic strongholds. Help you identify places where you need to change and be willing to make the change. Will you spend 40 days with God these next 40 days following a Savior who's powerful, who offers you a new sense of freedom? Sometime during these, between now and Easter, Will you let God help you clarify your mission and your purpose and your place and your role in the kingdom of God? If you accept this uh, challenge and spend 40 days in the wild with Jesus and spend some of the time in solitude with God alone, When you come out on the other side, you'll find yourself in a community of friends, a community of faith that is committed to the ways of Christ, that wants to make the kingdom of God known on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the choice. Suburban tame religion or a wilderness road in the wild. Abounds in deepest waters, a sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, and you won't start now.
top waters Let me walk upon the waters Whenever you would call me And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger Church family, as uh, as we go from this place, as we consider our challenge, I want to leave us with this reminder, the breath of God, the spirit of God, the holiness of God is within you. It is living and breathing in and through each one of us. So as we challenge ourselves to lean into it and challenge ourselves to enter into the adventure, know that God's promise always is to be with God's people. Amen and amen.